Guillotine by Cornell Woolrich. Also known as Steps Going Up, also known as Men Must Die. Copyright 1939. A thread of silver began to creep up the left side of each of the four bars in the cell window, like mercury in a thermometer. That was all. The sky seen through them was still as black as before. Keys clashed and the squeaky hinges of the cell grate began to turn. The commandant of the prison and an assistant dressed like a barber were standing out there in the opening. Lamont hadn't been asleep all night. Why should he bother? He was about to get all the sleep he needed. Nothing but sleep. He turned his head slowly like a man does who knows what the interruption is about. Already, it's not even late yet. It will be in another few minutes, was the answer. They'd brought in an iron basin slopping over with cold water and a tube of shaving cream in a nickel holder, which was the personal property of the Commandant. He must have used it lopsided on himself. It was worn down more on one side than the other, it was almost chisel-shaped. The assistant put the basin down on the edge of the bunk, spilling some on the gasoline-reeked blanket. You filled it too full, observed Lamont. I'm not going to take a bath. The commandant said, open your collar, Lamont. Lamont undid the top button, turned the gray flannel down all around his neck. Bend your head down. Lamont lowered his head, held it that way. The barber scooped a palm full of water from the basin, strewed it all around the back of his neck. Lamont jolted from the shock, winced. I always did hate cold water the first thing in the morning. Couldn't you have warmed it a little? The commandant didn't answer. He was busy watching the barber stroke the shaving stick all over the back of Lamont's neck from ear to ear. The barber didn't go near his jaws or cheeks with it, just the nape of his neck. The commandant produced a razor, handed it to him. Hold still, he warned the patient. We don't want to cut you. Lamont turned his head and gave him a caustic look obliquely over his shoulder. What you mean is, he said, you don't want to cut me ahead of time. Quit it, the commandant almost pleaded like a man trying to reason with someone who has him at a disadvantage. Keep your head down, the barber said. I'm as nervous as a witch, and the light in here is fierce. He brought his face close to the back of the subject's skull, peered attentively, tongue protruding from the corner of his mouth. He began to draw long, cautious, downward strokes with the razor from under the base of the skull to the top of the spine. Tufts of hair cemented together with silky waste rolled off, dropped to the floor. The skin looked clean and rosy underneath, the way a man's does after it is freshly shaven. You forgot the talcum, said Lamont satirically. I'll lay off, pleaded the commandant unhappily. What are they afraid of, that the blade won't be able to cut through a few stray hairs on my neck? Lamont sneered. It can't have much of an edge. It's just traditional to do it. Don't ask me why, the commandant answered. I don't originate these customs. Maybe from the days when they did it by hand and people wore pigtails down their neck. The assistant had gone out with the basin and razor. He came back again in a few moments with the traditional glass of rum on a small tin salver, offered it to the condemned silently. Sure, why not? It's a chilly morning. Lamont downed it in two long streamlined gulps, coughed a little, handed it back. Cigarette? The assistant produced a pair from the pocket of his blouse. Lamont took one, stuck it up vertically under his lip in a patchy fashion. Generous of the Republic, he slurred. Are you sure you can afford it? The commandant struck a sulfur match on the sole of his shoe, sheltered the flame for his use. Lamont blew a great churning funnel of smoke that seemed to veil the whole cell. When it cleared again, there was a priest standing there in the open doorway, looking in at them. Lamont fanned his hand at him negatively. Thanks, no, I'm not a last-minute Welsher. Tough baby, this one. 
breathed the commandant to his assistant. He got out a document with a lot of crackling of paper, shifted slightly over so he was in the exact center of the small cubicle, cleared his throat. Attention. Lamont saluted derisively from the edge of one eyebrow, having been found guilty of the murder of Armand Durand. Tell me something I don't know, heckled Lamont. The trouble with my wife is she doesn't understand me, the fat man said, drooping toward Babette. Poor Coco, she intoned mechanically. She tried planting her hand against his midriff to keep from getting swamped and nearly lost it up to the wrist. The way it sank in, she was on the very end stool at the bar. He was on the one next to her. He righted himself again, and she pulled her hand back out of the pillow stuffing of his vest. I like talking about my wife, he said. I like talking about her to other women, though she's down at Delville. Want to see her picture? Sure, Coco. He brought out vast quantities of pocket literature. His bulk didn't go down any, but it should have the way. He strewed business cards, letters, memoranda, a chunky wallet all over the bar. Here it is. He handed her a snapshot. I always carry her picture around to show to other women. She's not good enough for you, Coco. She was holding it in front of her, but her eyes missed the top of it by a good two inches. She was reading the name and address on one of the scattered envelopes lying on the bar, upside down at that. Armand Durand, 42 Rue Fontaine. Let's go over to my place. I don't like it in here. I don't know why you insisted on bring, bringing me here. Come on, it's not far. I'll show you my collection of seashells. What do the servants say? They're all away too. First, let me put all this stuff back in your pockets. No, keep your hands down. Let me do it for you. I like to wait on a distinguished looking man like you. This I'll put in this pocket and this in that one down there, and this one goes on this side. You shouldn't keep everything in one pocket. You should spread things around. It gives you a better figure, and you really have a fine figure, you know, if you'd only let it show properly. How understanding you are. She calls me fat. Ridiculous, Coco. Ah, I hate these skinny bean poles. She balanced the wallet speculatively in her hand before returning it to his inside pocket. Do you always carry that much money around on you? You shouldn't. That's only my spending money for this evening. I've got ten times that much on tap over at my house. She only goes to Deauville once a year, you know. I have to make hay while the sun shines. Come on over, we can sit there and talk much more comfortably. First, just let me play one more tune on the music box. That thing gives me a headache. Just for me, Coco. She pinched his chin, the top one, and strolled over to the mechanical music contraption. One of the other customers had the same idea at about the same time she did. He came up to it from the opposite direction, brass disc clutched in his hand, ready to be inserted. They both got there together, eyed one another coldly, ready to dispute priority. After I'm through, if you don't mind, she said in quite a loud voice. You've been monopolizing it all evening, he said surlily. Why don't you give somebody else a chance? The fat man on the bar stool looked unhappy, as though afraid he might have to take up the cudgels in her defense if things went much further. She put down her own brass disc on top of the instrument with a clash, as though staking her claim bent down, pretending to lip read the titles of the selections listed next to the slots. Armand Durand, 42 Rue Fontaine, nobody home, and a wad of dough loose around the place. Make it fast, I'll hold him here until you get back. She picked up her brass ringer, thrust it into the slot she had chosen. A brass door key that had rested under it stayed behind on top of the cabinet. Not for long. He leaned his elbow on the edge, and it disappeared. Strangled sounds started to lump out. She turned her back on him and moved defiantly away, so he turned his back on her and went the other way. Such types you meet in these places, she complained to her rotund escort. Did you see the look I got just because I wanted to use the coin piano ahead of him? Let's go. I told you I didn't like it here anyway. First, just one more little drink, eh? Just one more little drink with baby. Out of the corner of her mouth that was nearest the barman, she managed to slur strong enough to make him forget where he lives without being overheard close as she was 
to him. It was one too many. He evidently didn't realize his own limitations. His color began to change rapidly. When it had reached pea green, he suddenly clapped a hand to his mouth, got off the stool with a thump, and floundered through the nearest inner door. Stormy weather, she remarked knowingly to the barman. He came staggering out again in about five minutes. His hand was at the top of his head this time, as if to keep it from flying off. He started to go straight past her on his way out, as though he couldn't see straight anymore either. Wait, Coco, she squealed alarmedly, jumping down from her perch. You're not leaving, are you? His eyes rolled unseeingly at her. For him, she didn't exist anymore. He was in too much trouble. He had no stomach left for dalliance. Oh, let me get out of here, he shuddered. He, she tried to hold him back, even to the extent of hanging onto the tail of his coat with both hands. He was too bulky, even when he was feeling rocky, and she was too slender. Her, he simply towed her after him. Wait, sit down a minute. He'll give you something to settle your stomach. He flung her off tormentedly. Oh, get away from me. When I'm sick, I don't want strange women around me. I want my Marie. Oh, why does she have to go to Delville? She always puts cold applications on my head and holds my hand when I... The rest of it was lost as he went waveringly out to the street, got in a taxi, and was whisked off. Everyone in the place was laughing except the vet. She returned to her original place at the bar with a face long enough to reach the, her garters. Damn it, if I'd only gotten his phone number, I could ring his place up and... But no, there's no use phoning. He wouldn't answer. Take it easy, soothed the barman. You don't have to work that hard for a few lousy drinks. You don't get it. If he gets home too soon and catches Lamont there, Lamont will, will kill him, as sure as anything. According to the penal code section such and such, article so-and-so droned the commandant. He folded the document and replaced it in his pocket. Lamont was sitting there on the edge of the bunk, whistling a few bars of parade music. Is the concert over? That's good, he jeered. The commandant motioned him to his feet. It's time. The hairline of silver along the edges of the bars had spread to half their width now. Lamont got up, took a hitch in his trousers, started toward the cell door, the cigarette they had given him still between his fingers. The commandant walked on one side of him, the assistant on the other. Two guards were standing out there on either side of the cell opening, and they fell into position as he came out, replacing the commandant and assistant. The priest tried to insinuate himself at his elbow. Again, Lamont made that gesture of rebuff with his hand. I don't want anyone trailing after me. I'm not going far, and I can make it alone. Besides, I've got some thinking to do, and I can think better when there's no mumbling going on around me. Don't you want to ask forgiveness for your sins? My poor son, some other time, said Lamont coarsely. There are too many to remember offhand. It would take an accountant to keep track of them all. But there will be no other time. In a few moments, it will be too late. Lamont glanced at one of the stony-faced guards pacing slowly beside him. Some people don't know how to take us, he commented good-naturedly. What a front, marveled the assistant. The guy must have a height as thick as plate armor. It's put on, whispered the commandant knowingly. Watch him crack it when he gets to the top step. Lamont walked down the passageway between the two guards, still drawing on the cigarette he had been given. The smoke came trailing back over his shoulder like a jaunty plume. Babette was sitting on the high stool at the far end of the bar that she always occupied, legs crossed up to her chin nearly, fiddling around with the vermouth cassis. There was a man in a belt and top coat perched on the second stool up from her. He had a complexion as sallow as citron, and the dipped and brim of his hat made a sort of black eye mask across the upper half of his face. There was another man on the second stool up from him. The one in between was again vacant. There were a few tables around, with one or two of Copain's regular patrons slumped at them. There was a player piano over in the corner. Every once in a while, the second man would get up and go over and drop a washer in that he bought from Copain, and it would grind out a five-year-old tune, swallowing most of its notes. Babette looked too good for the place tonight, but then goodness is only relative after all. She had on a coat of squirrel fur and a moderate-sized diamond ring on her finger. It was too small to be imitation. Her fiddling with the stem of her glass kept getting more and more agitated. Copain finally edged up along the inside of the bar, suggested dryly, bite your nails if you have to, but don't break my glasses. 
she let go of it with a ringing impact. The man with the shadowy eye mask said, still staring straight in front of him, Nervous sister? What do you care? She flashed at him with white hate. She slipped off the stool, started to drift along the outside of the bar toward the street entrance. Something held her up. She looked it down, and his leg was sticking straight out from the hip, barring her way. He'd swiveled around on the stool, reared it all in a single move. What's your hurry? He said he wasn't trying to flirt. She controlled herself remarkably well, considering the provocation. I'm going in that door there, she said, thumbing across her shoulder. Okay, but you were turned the wrong way, that's all. His legs stayed out. She swept around, went over the other way and inside. It ebbed shut after her, showing a little white enamel sign. Dames. She came to life on the other side of it went streaking across the small enclosure to the window at the opposite end of it. The glass was doubly opaque, blown that way in the first place, and then covered with a patina of gray dust that hadn't been disturbed in years. She caught at it by the two finger holes set in the bottom of the frame, strained upward. It was stuck, cemented fast by that same accumulated dust around its seams. She reared one silken knee to the low sill to get leverage, pulled for all she was worth. It still wouldn't budge. She pounded des despairingly at it all around the wooden frame with the heel of her hand to try and loosen it up. She gave a look over her shoulder as if to see whether she was making too much noise. Luckily, that second bar fly had the piano pounding away out there full blast just then. It still wouldn't go up. She rounded a fist, swung her whole arm back past her shoulder, drove it forward hard. The window went up an inch or two. She got a grip on it from below and shot it up the rest of the way. Then she stared and her face twisted disappointedly. She slowly brought her upraised leg down off the sill again. The opening was barred on the outside. She came out to the bar again in a minute, smoking a cigarette. The man on the third stool down didn't turn around to look at her. He simply murmured, how do you like the view through the bars? As she settled down on her own stool again, she didn't answer. The other one had just finished another of his round trips to the music box. Above the noise, she suddenly said to Copain with desperate urgency, Give me a straight brandy, quick! He'd hardly taken his hand off it, then the little jigger was empty. Lamont was coming up to the bar from the street door. None of the three turned to look at him, neither herself nor the two barflies. He straddled the vacant stool between Babette and the man in the belted top coat. The man looked the other way. Babette looked down at the floor. Lamont winked at Copain and said, Introduce me to this good-looking customer of yours. It didn't go over. She didn't raise her head and Copain didn't crack a smile. What do you have, monsieur? He asked with strained formality. Hennessy and a Benedictine for the lady. Her head came up at that. I don't know you, she said with almost frightened intensity. I don't let strangers buy my drinks. A look of complete astonishment spread over his face. Are you crazy? He murmured under his breath. She stared him straight between the eyes. I never saw you before in my life. Can't I sit here without being pestered by every stranger that comes in? He nodded with ponderous understanding. Oh, I get it. A bone-shaped wad of tightly packed money rolled along the edge of the bar toward her. There was a diamond ring caught under the elastic that bound it. Here, buy yourself a new memory. She appealed to Copain, panic-stricken. Will you tell this man to leave me alone? She wailed. I'm a respectable woman. What does he mean by... She broke off short, eyes dilated. A hand had come to rest on Lamont's shoulder from in back of him. He turned, looked up the arm to the face of the man with the hat making the shadowy eye mask standing beside him now. The other one was standing in back of him. Come on, let's go and talk things over. The first one said, kind of got rich quick, didn't you? 
He picked up the wad of bills in the ring. The girl dropped off her stool, flashed out alongside them as they started for the door with Lamont between them. Wait, aren't you going to take me too? The one in the top coat gave her a push that sat her back on the stool again and rocked it like a pendulum. Who the hell wants you? You served your purpose. We knew he'd come to you. She got up a second time, caught up with them just as they reached the street door. Wait, she pleaded. She stepped up close to Lamont, rose on tiptoes, pressed her lips to his. Take this with you so you'll understand what I was trying to do just now. What was it, vanilla or cinnamon? Sneered one of the detectives as they roughhoused him out between them. She went slowly back to her place at the bar again. There was no one at it now but Copain polishing glasses. Why couldn't he have stayed away from me? For one night, she lamented. She buried her head in her arms on top of the bar. Try crying a little more quietly, can't you? He said irritably after a while. Everyone's looking at you. Looks like it's going to be a nice day, said Lamont cheerfully as the courtyard gate swung open before him and his escorts. The prison wings walling in the enclosure on three sides were still black at the bottom platinum colored along their tops with the first rays of daylight. There were two short lines of people standing there motionless in the gloom, not more than ten or twelve in all. They were all bareheaded in spite of the chill air. Lamont laughed unaffectedly. In honor of my death, they think, he said, the platform of newly planed, unpainted planks was the most conspicuous thing in the enclosure. It stood out even in the gloom. Little curls of planed off wood lay scattered about on the ground. Two tall uprights projected themselves from it against the white dawn clouds scurrying across the slate sky. They made enough racket last night putting that thing up, Lamont interjected. I didn't mind for myself, but it must have kept all the, all the other poor devils in the place awake. He glanced scornfully at the small group of spectators. People that get up this early even for an execution are fools. He and his escort moved slowly away from the inner gate until they were standing at the foot of the platform. His eyes traveled appraisingly, appraisingly up it to the top. Twenty steps, he said. That's a lot of steps. I never did like climbing much. Why don't they make them lower? Have you anything to say? Lamont turned toward the witnesses. Stick around. It'll be even more fun watching me come down than watching me go up. A gasp went up at his boldness. They shifted uneasily. He turned his back on them. They, the guard on each side of him cupped a hand to his elbow to support him. That's all right, Lamont said quietly. I can make it. He raised his left foot and set it down on the first plank step then brought the right up, one up to the second. Lamont had an elbow hooked around each of the end bars in the cell window, was resting his chin solemnly on his sandwiched hands just inside them. The grate wailed open behind him. Have you an appointment? He growled without turning his head. Five minutes, eh? The voice of the guard said under his breath to someone. The apparatus banged closed again. His footfalls died off down the cemented corridor outside. Lamont knew there was someone in the cell with him. He still wouldn't turn around and look. A tapering white hand crept down each of his shoulders into crossed to form an embrace around his throat. A faint fragrance of, Ber of Urbana, whose trade name was Mon Hong, wafted about him and silken hair caressed the back of his head. He didn't move. His eyes glittered balefully. Suddenly he gave a violent fling. The interlocked arms were burst open, and, he, and she was flung back against the side wall of the cell. She didn't say anything, although the impact must have hurt her. In her silence was her forgiveness. The diamond and the squirrel coat were gone. She was all in black. What did you come around for? He glowered. To make sure there wasn't a gold tooth in my head you overlooked the first time? You can look it over when it tumbles into the basket, you ghoul. She kept looking at him pleadingly. Yes, I was that way until I met you. Until? You mean to say you haven't already found somebody else? Don't tell me you're losing your neck. 
You're blind. I took things from you, yes, but not because they were things, only because they were from you. He looked her over. What do you do, get cleaned of the races, or is that your death cell visiting costume? They went to pay for our lawyer. His face changed for the first time. Are you kidding? I thought the tribunal appointed him. I was afraid to take any chances. In the end, it didn't do any good anyway. He went over to her, looked at her puzzledly. What's come over you? I'm in love, she said quietly. He shook his head. You poor monkey. You're going to have a guy without a head on your hands in a couple of weeks more. The guard showed up, hitched his head at her through the bars. She turned on him with a flash of her old self again. Get out of here. That wad I slipped you ought to be good for another ten minutes at least. He slunk off again, grumbling. I'm liable to get fired for it. It's against the regulations. She turned back to Lamont again, took a stranglehold on his prison shirt with both hands. I'm not going to let you go. Try stopping me, he snickered morosely. I've never been licked yet. There must be something I can do. Maybe you can make the, the president. She had no time even to shudder at that. You have been found guilty by this same tribunal. He's the only one can commute your sentence. A commutation would mean life imprisonment, and that would mean Devil's Island. No thanks, he said hastily, grimacing with repulsion. I'll take mine the quick way. It's got to be an outright pardon than Lamont on what grounds does he issue pardons. Help me. You know more about these things than I do. Only when it has been proved there's been a miscarriage of justice. No help there. They left no doubts at all at the trial. That lawyer told me it was no use. What else? If public sympathy is sufficiently aroused in favor of the condemned, and people start drumming up a, com a campaign, no help there either. We're just a couple of Apaches with records long enough to, cut, to fly a kite on. And is that all? Are those the only reasons? The only ones I can think of offhand, he shrugged. Oh, sure, once in a blue moon when the, when the state executioner passes away, it's traditional to offer a pardon to the next man in line for shortening. But that's just a free case. That only happens maybe once in 40, 50 years. They live a long time, those birds. She let go of his shirt front, stepped slowly back. Her eyes were hard sequins. This one isn't going to, she breathed almost inaudibly. He stared at her uncomprehendingly. She turned without another word and began ramping on the bars of the... Great. In as big a hurry to be let out now as she had been to stay. Babette, he exclaimed hoarsely. What are you thinking of doing? Are you crazy? Come back here a minute. Listen to me. She shrugged his hand off her shoulder. I'm going to get your pardon, baby. Don't ask me any questions. That knife blade with your name on it is never going to fall. The right foot. The ninth step. The left. The tenth. The right. The eleventh. Lamont's eyes were up on a level with the base of the execution platform now. He saw the basket there, filled with sawdust and shavings. He shook the thing that was supposed to drop into it, his head, almost imperceptibly, as if to say, no, not this one. He saw the bottom of the apparatus, the wooden slab with the U-shaped depression in it. Several feet higher up between the two uprights was a second one, the mate to it. It would be brought down when they were ready, joined to the first. The two U-shaped gaps would unite to form a perfect circle with his neck in between. He saw feet standing around. He didn't bother looking up to the faces over them. He wasn't there yet. That was all that mattered. Two things weren't there yet. He and it. The executioner and the blade. The left foot. The twelfth step. The right one. The, ah, uh, no. Nothing doing. Not that one. That was the thirteenth. Not at a time like this, you bet not. He lifted his right foot higher still, skipped one, brought it down on the 14th. That would bring him up to the top quicker, but he wasn't touching that 30, that 13th step on his own execution scaffold for love or money. His action threw a slight hitch into the river room of his guard's ascent. It took him up a step higher than they, at least one leg was. They didn't know why he'd done it. They weren't counting them like he was, but they corrected the discrepancy by both taking a quick in-between step on the 13th, then coming up even with him. They didn't say anything, but he knew what they must be thinking. It was the first time in their experience that the condemned had ever taken two steps at a time, as if in a hurry to get up there quicker. Well, 
It was going to be the first time in their experience that the condemned hung around on the guillotine platform, waiting for the executioner to show up too, and then being left stranded up there in the end when he didn't. There was an old expression waiting at the church door. The, this would be something new, waiting at the guillotine. The left foot, the 15th step, the right, the 16th. It was a little inconspicuous family cafe on a side street with the same faces there every night. She came in looking saintly and hardworking, a black scarf draped around her head that gave her a Madonna-like air, a basket of blood-bred carnations under her arm, a bottle of red ink back in her room, told how they had got some, if not all, of their unusual color, which was far deeper than anything ever seen in nature. She moved slowly from table to table, intoning monotonously, carnations, two for five carnations. No one bought. They were too red for most tastes. The checker players, the newspaper readers, the political arguers didn't even look at her. She was already a familiar sight here, seemed to have made the place her regular beat for some unknown reason. No one had ever yet seen her make a sale. The waiter even said, you never give up, do you? As he passed her. No, she thought, I never do. That same upended newspaper held rigid on its reading stick was over in the far corner against the wall. That, too, had been here every night with a small black coffee before it and sometimes one slim, refined-looking hand resting on the table below it. A voice always came from behind it. Each time she strayed over toward it, got one already, thanks. She tried again tonight, just the same. Carnations, she purred, coming to a dead stop before it. Two for five, the reddest you've ever seen. The paper flattened abruptly to reveal a benevolent-looking gentleman of about 58 or 60, not a mean line in his round face, periwinkle blue eyes, innocent as a child's, behind steel-rimmed reading glasses. Oh, excuse me, I see you have a flower already, she said. He drew it slowly out of his lapel, looked at it, and looked at it then at hers. He must have already glimpsed the vivid hue of her wares nights ago, without her knowing it, perhaps through a regent's paper. Tonight, curiosity or professional envy had finally got the better of him. I thought I had the reddest one in town. I see yours are even redder still. Would you mind telling me where you get them? I grow them myself, Babette said demurely. His face lit up with interest. Sit down a minute. I grow my own flowers too. That is my only recreation. Remarkable what results you obtain. They look almost artificial, and yet they are real. One can tell that by touching them. How do you do it? What seeds do you use? What soil? The whole conversation became a monologue, even if she had had any technological knowledge on the subject, and she only the smattering that a quick reading of a handbook on garden flowers had managed to give her. She wouldn't have had a chance to use it. All she was able to put in from time to time was, I do too, and so do I. He was a very lonely old man and starving for a good talk in this particular hobby. So you get them from Normandy, from your people. How I would love to try them out in my own garden. I'll bring some around to you. Where can I find you? 39 Rue de la Therese. He was so overjoyed, the precautions of a lifetime melted away. Will Thursday suit you? She asked, knowing damned well what Thursday was. He dropped his eyes. No, I have an early morning appointment. Wednesday evening, then. Fine. You won't forget? He said almost pleadingly. She gave him an eloquent look under, from under her lashes. I'm not likely to, monsieur. The waiter flagged her on her way out. Do you know who that was you were just talking to? Who? The state executioner. Don't spread it around or you will frighten other, our other customers away. He comes here every night. She tried to act horrified. It didn't go over very well. It went over well enough to fool the waiter. His right foot was already resting on the platform itself. Slowly, draggingly, his other broke from the 20th and last step came up beside it. Below the courtyard was still a blue pool of night, but the tops of the prison buildings all around him were already white with daylight. The faces down below, turned upward, staring at him, were like so many blurred white ovals. The guards who had come up with him started to lead him slowly around and back up the two tall uprights. They were harmless as yet. They couldn't hurt him. 
the widow had no teeth. The knife wasn't in place between them. The executioner wasn't up here yet either. They shouldn't have brought Lamont out so soon. Everything should have been in readiness by the time he made his appearance. Somebody had botched things up. They had been so sure the man who had never once been late in 40 years would be at his post by the time the victim reached the summit that they had gone ahead. There would be a big scandal as a result. Unnecessary, unnecessary cruelty. His pardon would be granted all the more readily because of it. He was standing behind the death thing now. He centered the canal of vision that ran down between the two parallels on the other, on the outer courtyard gate, like one centers a target through the sights of a gun, held it steadily and focused through there from then on. The executioner was supposed to come in through there, but he wouldn't. There were a pair of armed guards waiting there by it, ready to, come to open it on the instant. The instant that would never come. A cigarette was burning on the edge of the table. There was a calendar on the wall. The first 23 days of the current month had been crossed off one by one. Beyond them, there was still one blank date block left. Then came a large red bullseye, scoring the 25th day of the month, and 17 hours of the last blank space were already gone. It was five o'clock in the afternoon. That was all right. Babette wanted to be late. She would catch the executioner at a supper. She took a long pin and turned over the dead cockroaches on their, under their backs, one by one, dead, lifeless, stiff they were, hard as coffee beans. It must be good stuff, whatever it was. It was in a little cylindrical shaker, not much different than the shakers pepper and stuff come in. It came out gray, though. She sprinkled a little on the newspaper that held the dead insects. She lowered her face carefully toward it. No odor, and as for taste, it's sweet, it attracts them, the drug clerk had assured her. I can guarantee its efficacy. But you have no children around the house, have you? It's very deadly, you know. I have no children, she had smiled enigmatically. It had taken the poison from 10 to 15 minutes with the roaches. She had timed it. Of course, she couldn't tell when they actually died, only when they stopped moving. Maybe they lived on a few minutes paralyzed after they stopped moving. With a human being, it should take longer. Double it, no, triple it might be better. 45 minutes before the first effects became noticeable. Hell, she was not a physiologist, just a woman in love. Sometime during the night anyway, she murmured aloud. It depended, of course, on how much you gave. In this case, it was going to be the whole container. She didn't just want to postpone the execution. She wanted to cancel it altogether. He wasn't so young anymore either. That, that would help make it permanent. She wondered if it would hurt much. Well, naturally, it wouldn't be exactly comfortable until the paralysis or torpor set in. It couldn't be helped. If a stomach pump were used in time or a quick antidote administered, he could be saved. But he probably wouldn't know what it was in time. He'd think it was indigestion first, and then a cramp, and then appendicitis, and by that time, it would be too late to save him. The stuff would have to go into something where its Swedish content would content would be out of place, otherwise he was liable to notice it. Stop before he'd got all he should. She wrapped a pocket handkerchief around the container, first making sure the little punctures at the top were sealed by the metal top. Then she thrust it into the pocket of the cheap coat sweater she wore, where it would be easier to get at in a handbag. She had stripped the protective label off, and a flick of her thumbnail would, let, would lift the entire lid when the time came, she picked up the little envelope containing carnation seeds. She had bought them for a couple of sous. They would come up as the ordinary white kind if they were ever planted, but he wouldn't be alive to see that. She opened the door, started out. Then she stepped back for a minute, took a pencil, and crossed out the last blank date on the calendar. They were all crossed out now, up to the red bullseye. Her face was white, beautiful and deadly as she closed her room door after her. 39 Rue de la Therese, he had said. The outline of a watching fellow inmate showed behind nearly every barred window around the three sides of the prison courtyard. They stood there perfectly motionless. Not a sound could be heard. That breathless silence attendant upon an execution hung like a pall over the darkly looming, well-populated buildings. They wouldn't want to look. Some of them, those that were due for it, 
themselves, but they wouldn't be able to stay away from their cell windows. He could see the little white bulges their fists made, made gripping the uprights, two to each opening, all around the three sides. It was barbarous to let them watch, and this was supposed to be a civilized country. They condemned the Americans for galvanizing them to death, plugging them in like living lamps. He supposed the prison authorities let them look on as a sort of deterrent. He kept staring through the uprights at the gate. There was a complete waiting silence, both above and below, with the low pulse of tension already beginning to be felt through it. He was almost crooning over them like a child does a new toy. He was in the garden behind his cottage. He had a sprinkling can in his hand, an old tattered straw hat on his head to keep the setting sun out of his eyes, and he was puttering around between the flower beds in a pair of old carpet slippers. And he had killed about 400 people. Are you coming in, or do you want the meal to get cold? The hatchet-faced housekeeper called disapprovingly from the, from the back door. Her disapproval was probably equally for his never-ending flowers and babettes intrusion here. You must let me pay you for them, the executioner said to Babette, turning toward the house. Oh no, I wouldn't think of it. Except, accept them as a gift. No, no, I insist. After you've put yourself out coming all the way across town like this, it's the least I can do. She let him get the back door open. Then she said wistfully, mmm, that smells good. She couldn't notice a thing. Of course, how thoughtless of me. You must be hungry. Will you join us? Us. Her heart sank. That meant the hawk-eyed old battle axe must sit right at the table with him. With both of them there, she'd never have had a chance to pull the stunt off. I'm afraid it would be putting you out. Nonsense. Now you come in. I won't take no for an answer into the gargoyle. I've asked Mademoiselle to have a bite with us. You have, she grunted dryly. As they took their places at the table ahead of her, he whispered to Babette on the side. Don't pay any attention to her. She's always a little crabby like this. Looking around her, it was hard to believe she was in the house of whom she was, just a suburban cottage with chintz curtains. She was spooning soup with one hand, holding the handkerchief wrapped uh, cylinder in the other, in readiness below table level. The housekeeper spoke for the first time since they'd sat down, as if trying to exclude Babette from the conversation. Did you go to the ministry this afternoon? Of course, he said shortly, as if he didn't like the topic. Babette knew what she meant, the Ministry of Justice. She eyed the soup tureen speculatively, but he probably wouldn't take a second plate, and it was over on the housekeeper's side of the table anyway. She'd never work it, never. Did they give you the order in your expense money for tomorrow? Naturally. Must we talk about it now? There was no mistaking his impatience. He glanced meaningfully at their guest. The order for the execution, she meant. It's the only chance I get, the old, the old woman answered tartly. You're so taken up in your flowers every minute of the time you're home. She got up and went out, came in again with a dish of stew. Babette's hand, poised just under the table room with the cylinder in it, dropped down to her lap again. She was bending over it so damned protectively, portioning it out, almost as if she suspected something. The pale pink ones go best. She answered his question, hardly knowing what she was saying at all. There isn't as much demand for the whites or reds. That red of, that glass of red wine of his was within easy reach of her. If she could get him to turn his head away from it, she pushed with her thumbnail and felt the head of the canister drop off into her lap. She stuck it in her sweater pocket. Her eyes stabbed speculatively across his shoulder. The window overlooking the street was toward his left, far enough far enough over so he'd have to turn to see out of it. And the old crow, she'd have to turn to the opposite way, toward the right, but she'd still be three quarters face this way. It was almost certain not to succeed, and yet she had to try it. There was no more time, and this was probably the last time. She gazed through the window. Her face seemed to light up with admiration. Look at that. What a beautiful sunset that is. The two heads shifted, her hand swift, swiftly shot above the table. Just in time, her eyes sought the face of the old woman, great, afraid of him of the two. She was looking neither at the window nor at Babette herself, but at the wall behind the ladder, getting the sense of my indirection. 
But that knew, without looking, there must be a mirror hanging there, showing not only the street but her own back as well. With just the slightest of awkward hitches, her hand rose the rest of the way, far above where it had intended to, touched the bald of handkerchief it grasped to the tip of her nose a couple of times, dropped down again to safe oblivion in her lap. She prayed the container hadn't been invisible. It's magnificent, he agreed, turning back. It's as usual, scoffed the old woman. Babette turned her head casually, glanced behind her. There was a long mirror just past her chair, set into the top of the sideboard. The wine glass stood out conspicuously in it. Any move of her own hand toward it would have been perfectly visible from the rear. That old wench, had she done that purposely? Did she sense something, or was it just her innate pe peskiness? She went out, came back with a plate of apples. She polished them off with her apron one by one, set them back again. Oh, then we're not going to have sweet pancakes? said Babette innocently. What made you think we were? snapped the tur termagant. Oh, nothing. Only I saw a mixing bowl standing in there with some stuff beaten up in it when I passed through the kitchen, and I thought, well, you were wrong. That's the dough for the biscuits for Monsieur's breakfast tomorrow morning. I make them myself. I get up extremely early on certain occasions, he explained, trying to temper her crossness, and she has no time to prepare them then. Has to mix them and set them out the night before. Now I know where it goes, exulted Babette inwardly. If the devil only gives my ha hand a lift. At what time in the evening do you usually start out to sell these flowers of yours? asked the housekeeper pointedly, as though she suspected but of having another trade entirely. Usually around eight, when the after supper trade begins to arrive at the cafes. I'll have to be leaving in a few minutes. There is no hurry, my child, her host said paternally. Sit and rest first. The doorbell rang and a whistle blew outside. The housekeeper jumped. There's the, the postman. It must be a letter from my sister. She went running out to the door. Babette was only a second behind her in getting up. May I have a glass of water? I'm so thirsty. Don't trouble. I know where to find it. A moment later, she was standing over the mixing bowl in the kitchen, the canister of death upside down but above it. She even gave the bottom of it a good thump, so every last grain would be sure to come out. She gave the wooden spoon a couple of turns around in it, so it wouldn't all clog up in one place. The housekeeper was standing in full sight in the opposite doorway when she went back, but she was lost in the letter when which she was standing reading there. Her face had grown twenty years younger. She was off guard at last. She hadn't even noticed that her guest had left the table. She said Jean's expecting another baby. What do you think of that? I'll have to go now, Monsieur, simpered Peppa. All sunshine and sweetness. She lowered her eyelashes demurely. It'll kill him long before he gets Anywhere, anywhere near my Lamont, she was thinking complacently. A voice from one of the cell openings croaked out abruptly, Take him down! It was like the crack of a whip in the stillness. A shattered silence closed in again from all sides for only a moment. Then other voices started to take it up all around the courtyard. They rang out hollowly, echoing back from the stone facades of the prison buildings. Take him down off there. Have a heart, you lousy dogs. He was to be killed just once, not a hundred times over. No executioner, no execution. The cries blended as they found a catchword, rose to a terrible thumping dirge. Down, down, down. Lamont never took his eyes from that gate, seen through the open sluice of the guillotine. He didn't even take time off to blink. The man with the blood red carnation in his buttonhole came out of the front door of the rambling cottage at 39 Rue de la Therese at exactly 4.45 a.m. It was pitch dark still, and the street lights were still on. In his right hand, he carried a heavy ebony cane, on which was an engraved plate. In his left, a black leather bag, 28 inches long, 8, eight inches high. In it, on a bed of black velvet, its edge ground to razor sharpness lay that thing which belonged between those two uprights Lamont was staring through so steadily. He was a man going to work, just like any other. He was still brushing the last stray biscuit crumbs from the corner of his mouth and the edge of his mustache. He shook his head peevishly. Too sweet, he grumbled. Too sweet. They'll give me heartburn. 
she is losing her neck. The possibility of being assailed by a digestive disturbance at the exact moment of performing his job filled him with concern. Suppose he committed the ghastly impropriety of hiccuping or even belching up there on the platform in front of everyone. That would be a fine thing, wouldn't it? Death was entitled to a certain respect, a solemnity. The last moments of even the lowest of criminals deserved consideration and dignity. He walked the two suburban blocks from the cottage to the end of the subway line, went downstairs, bought a second-class ticket at the change booth, took his place behind the barrier, bag in hand. A few early morning workers slowly collected behind him, charwomen, porters, and busboys. The first train of the day came in. The barrier was raised and he entered. There were plenty of seats at this early hour. He sat in the far corner, placed his bag carefully across his knees, rather than trust it to the floor, and rested both hands on the head of his cane. He was not nervous. What he had to do today, he had been doing for 40 years, and his father before him. It was their métier. It was a job that had to be done, and only he and all of France had the legal right to do it. From Strasbourg to the Pyrenees, and from Brittany to the Italian border, not a human life could be taken by law, but through his hand. He and he alone was the delegate of 40 million people to carry out their orders. He was a well-traveled man. He had been to nearly every city or large town in the country at one time or another. This, today, was not far, just a half hour's train trip outside the city. He studied the advertising placards below the car ceiling to keep his mind occupied, while the subway swiftly carried him downtown. His stomach felt quite heavy by now. The stuffy subway air, no doubt. I should have refused that last plateful, he thought, but I was afraid of offending her. She always takes it as a personal slight if I don't finish off the whole batch. He consulted his old-fashioned watch. If he hurried, he'd have time to get off, get a cup of coffee to settle his stomach. He decided to do this rather than risk a belch in the midst of the execution. He got off, hurriedly swallowed some black coffee, but he wasn't feeling any better when he got on another subway train. And added to his pain was nervousness. He had cut his time too thin. He would get there a little late now. He hunched in his seat to ease the strange agony in his belly, and then the guard called his station. He rose, clutching his bag. Yes, he felt distinctly heavy beneath the vest. All the recent springiness had gone from his gait. I'll feel better as soon as I get up to the street again, he assured himself. These metro tubes have been closed up all night without ventilation. He found it rather arduous, climbing the long flight of steps to street level, was panting and felt weak at the knees when he finally reached the top. Despite his lateness, he could not move faster. It was still dark out, but downtown here the city was already fully awake. Lighted buses rolled by, people were already out and about their business. The railroad station was directly opposite, on the other side of the square. He crossed over to it entered the vast cavern of its main waiting room, stepped up to one of the wickets, a round trip ticket to R, he said. Second class, of course. He saw the ticket seller glance at him curiously as he returned his change. Does he recognize me? He wondered. That always made him feel uncomfortable, even at this late date, but the look hadn't been one of recognition. It had been more of one of, a, of questioning concern. He stopped before a mirrored weighing machine on his way out to the platform, looked at himself in it. Why, no wonder he had glanced at him that way. His face was ghastly white, almost livid. Impossible! He didn't feel that bad. It must be these arc lights in here that gave one that pallor. The queasiness in his stomach was increasing momentarily. That old housekeeper of mine has given me a bad attack of indigestion, he thought accusingly. I only hope it doesn't become acute. He wondered if there would be time to drink a bromo at the station buffet to settle his stomach. He glanced up at the clock. No, the next, no, the next train left in two minutes. He'd have to get on. 
he'd have to get right on. The one he should have taken had left ten minutes before. When he had reached it, he sank back on one of the straw-lined seats in the second-class coach with a low moan of relief. Luckily, there was no one else in the compartment with him. He hated people around him when he didn't feel well. The train was moving, and that only made him feel worse. He threw his head back against the seat and let it roll limply with the motion of the train. His cane fell over, and he left it there. His hands went to his throat, dragged the knot of his tie aside, plucked open his collar. Nothing seemed to give him any relief. He tried opening the window to let some fresh air in. A lot of cinders and nauseating coal gas came in instead. He only felt worse, but he was unable to summon the strength to close it again. Suddenly, a knife seemed to go through his middle. It was so sharp, so unexpected. Subconsciously, he even looked down to see if perhaps his bag hadn't opened and he had injured himself in some way on the protruding edge of what it held. The agony came again in a minute or two, and then again. Each time, deeper, more slashing. Sweat was standing out on his forehead now. The train had already stopped twice, gone on again. His sight would dim momentarily, then clear again. The knife pains had become so incessant now, they merged into one long, drawn-out probing. I must fight this off until after. I must finish that job first. Then I can become ill to my heart's content. I, I have never yet failed in my duty. My father never did, nor his father before him. He struggled to his feet, reeled against the compartment door, threw it open. He had to hang on to the frame with both hands to keep from going down. The midsection of his body kept trying to fold over him like a clothespin. He stiffened his back against it. The drawing was excruciating, but he counteracted it, held straight. Conductor, he called hoarsely above the clacking of the wheels. Conductor, hurry. The conductor came into sight at the upper end of the passageway, showed instant concern at sight of his twisted, agonized face. He ran down to him. What's the matter, sir? Will you see that I get off this train at R? Will you make sure that I do? I am slightly ill. That's, that's the next station. We get there in five minutes. He'd better let me have the station master call an ambulance. No, no, no. Nothing must hinder me. He raised his head with anguished pride of office. I am Mr. Paris, and I have an appointment that must be kept. Just give me your arm and make sure that I get down from the train. That's all. I'll see to the rest. The prison is right opposite the station in my bag. Don't let me leave my bag behind. The conductor's eyes had dilated at the revelation of who he was. But sir, you're in a state of collapse. There's froth in your mouth. You'd better have immediate attention. Just get me off at R. I'm late now. Should have been on the train before this. Was the almost inaudible answer. My duty comes first. The train began to slow. The conductor put an arm around his waist, threw open the outside door of the compartment, helped him down the step. His hand flexed graspingly at his side, and the conductor put the black bag into it. But at least let someone assist you to get over there. No, no, no. The tradition is that Mr. Paris comes in alone. The gate opens for him and him alone. I will not create a scene at such a time, being dis bring discredit on what I stand for. I am the law of France. The train was starting on its way again behind him. He stood there teetering leaning first forward, then backward, threatening to fall against the line of cars, picking up speed behind him and be flung down. The pain was suddenly abruptly gone, leaving a lack of any sensation whatever in its wake. A numbness was starting to spread over him. He could feel his toes and fingers beginning to cool. I will get there, he murmured. I must, this momentary reprieve will see me through. He put one foot before him, followed it with the other, stiffly with unflexed joints, like an automaton threatening to topple at every step, he moved through the little suburban wayside station out into the cobbled square beyond. Facing him across it were the green-gray prison buildings outlined in the first glimmer of the dawn. His legs suddenly went down under him and he stumbled to one knee. He had gone over the curb without feeling it. He had no more sensation in his feet to tell by. He picked himself up again, swayed, forced himself on. His hand rose to his neck, fumbled numbly to close his disarrayed collar and went up too high. He couldn't guide it anymore. It touched the side of his head first, then he brought it down to the right level, 
closed the gap in his collar. Since he couldn't work the buttonhole, it only opened again. They were making a lot of noise in there, shouting, calling out, down, down. A little knot of curiosity mongers was huddled about the great gate before him. Looking in, someone turned and saw him, and they parted before him in silent awe, fell back, leaving a lane through their midst for him to pass in by. A sudden hush fell, and through the crew, crevice of the guillotine, Lamont saw the gates slowly widen, and a figure, erect, rigid, coming inexorably forward in the uncertain dawn light. She's let me down, she's failed, and suddenly fear flooded through him, and he, he, and he all but crumbled where he stood. The executioner had reached the foot of the platform now, but something was the matter. They were running toward him to assist him. She's got, she got to him after all. He's groggy, he's floundering. He'll never make those 20 steps, Lamont shouted to himself. He couldn't see him for a minute. The edge of the platform intervened. Had he fallen? Had he fallen? Had he expired? Then there was a creak, and with the slowness of a deep sea diver emerging from the water, the head of the executioner rose above the platform edge, assisted upward by two of them. The man with the red carnation handed over the black bag. Affixed the blade, he stood there now on the platform. He motioned them to take their hands from him. His gaze rested dimly on Lamont. I apologize, monsieur, he had murmured, for making you wait like this. Lamont could not answer. He only stared horribly. They had inserted the blade in the sluice. The pulleys were worked in reverse, and it rose slowly to the top, like quicksilver in a thermometer. Prepare the subject. The executioner's hand groped for Lamont's shoulder. He had no strength left even to bear down. Press him to his knees. It was done for him. Wild, fierce hope welled through Lamont. He'll never make it. He can't even see straight anymore. His eyes are dimming. A husky whisper sounded from him meant for Lamont, although he couldn't distinguish him anymore, didn't know where to direct it. Have courage, you will not feel it, the, de the dead consoling the dying. The upper half of the wooden collar was fitted down on Lamont's neck. The basket was shifted forward under his face. A minute more, Lamont kept saying to himself, a minute more, a minute more, and I went. He's starting to fall. There he goes. There he goes over. I went. He shouted it aloud. The executioner flailed downward, face foremost. His hands extended spasmodically in the direction of the instrument as he went over, swept curvingly past, caught on the lever that released the counterweight, seized it, dragged it down with them. I wit. The weight shot up. The knife flashed down and cut the word in two. Two dead men lay side by side on the platform. Guillotine by Cornell Warwick Read by Christopher Highland. Sound design by William Pattison. A WCP Enterprises audio production. Copyright 2024. William Pattison and Christopher Highland.